Hello, we're in Edinburgh. It's me, David Robertson. And me, Christopher Carter. We are the Religious Studies Project. And because this week is a video episode, we thought we'd do a video intro. Obviously. Um, um, we are coming to you live from the heart of the Reformed Kirk in Scotland. That is a new college, uh, the School of the University of Edinburgh, which has recently, um, at time of recording, uh, taken over by Church of Scotland types. But, um, it's weird, it rather quieter today. You can maybe hear the faint bagpipes in the background there. Um, this interview, um, well, there's a new issue of Implicit Religion. Isn't there, there is. Let's start there. There's a new issue of Implicit Religion, guest edited by um, RSP pal Beth Singler on the mm -hmm. subject of AI and religion. Um, and it features papers from some of our friends and colleagues, I mean Beth, but also uh, Ting Guo, who we studied with here at Edinburgh, and Jonathan Tuckett, who you may recognise from this week's interview. Yeah, Jonathan's been speaking with Bettina Schmidt. It was on the topic of her keynote address to the um, Contemporary Religion and Historical Perspective Conference that David organised at the OU That's back correct. in February. Yes. And uh, we'll just pass directly over to them and see you on the other side. We'll see you at the end of the summer and hopefully we'll look refreshed and not just older. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to an entirely new format of interview with the Religious Studies Project. Uh, you may now recognise my face as something even more familiar. I'm the Features Editor Jonathan Tuckett and we are once again testing out the video format. Uh, so this time we actually have Bettina Schmidt with us who is now President-elect of the BASR uh, and also Senior Lecturer at professor. professor, apologies, professor at Trinity St. David's at, in Wales. Um, so we are actually currently at the OU conference on religion and its publics and we are here today to talk a little bit about Bettina's keynote speech in which she was talking about some of the older figures in religious studies, figures that one of whom I personally feel should be buried <laughs> and never remembered, but I'm sure Bettina is going to give us a valid reason why we should be reading some of these people even today in the modern research university. So just the quick summary of the keynote speech. <laughs> Well, Jonathan, to give a quick uh, summary is always difficult for a long speech, but I will do, uh, do my best. So in my, my keynote lecture yesterday, I wanted to highlight that um, we can learn something from historical figures in our field, in particular from three of what I call founding fathers of the wider field of study of religions. I um, quite um, consciously didn't, collect, uh, didn't select also a female scholar, which um, is a bit of a problem because we also had a few founding mothers, but I highlight the work of three figures who are often described or even were described in the beginning uh, in quite negative terms. Um, for instance, uh, one of the figures which probably you think we should bury is uh, Rudolf Otto, who uh, was the professor for systematic theology at my old alma mater, uh, University of Marburg. And um, for the 400 years of um, the anniversary of the university in um, uh, 1925, he uh, was able to found a new museum, the first museum of uh, religious artifacts, which is called until today the Religionskundige Sammlung. In this museum, which he founded outside any faculty, but, but as a, a university um, collection, he gave home of uh, a rich um, the, you know, religious artifacts from all over the world in re relationship to religion. However, some of the other theologians uh, during his time and, and their students quite uh, demissively called it Gottsen Temple, which is a very negative term in German. 
Um, and um, the, the other figure was Andrew Lang, who himself described himself as an outcast of academia. So he had um, held for a couple of years fellowship at Merton College in Oxford. He decided to um, withdraw from Merton because he wanted to get married. In that time, a fellow was not um, allowed to, to get married. And the third person I highlighted was Merritt, Robert um, uh, or uh, uh, Merritt, um, the successor of Edward uh, Taylor in Oxford as reader in social anthropology, but he himself and others described him as an anomaly, though he had a university uh, position um, in, in the wider recognition nowadays of the beginning of, of an interest in religion from an academic point of view. He is often just a footnote. The um, Oxford University still has the merit lectures people often are not are no longer interested in his work apart from looking at his work early work on mana and in and, and others and I think um, we can still learn from from these figures of course with reservations they were children of the time and uh, they were firmly um, linked to to a certain belief system at the time, evolutionism, social Darwinism, and so on. But nonetheless, they all three had um, something um, which which uh, really made them special for my own field. Sure. So, uh, so I mean, the obvious question then is, that what, is what like in a certain respect, you've, you've mentioned Rudolf Otto, who comes from a very theological background, and you've talked mentioned Lang and Marat, who both come from. E.B. Tyler's background. So it's two very different backgrounds here. So what is it that unites the three of them together as a kind of collective for you that allows you to talk to them as a single group, as it were, in this context? Yes, this is an interesting field. Why did I uh, choose to include Otto in, in this mix uh, mm -hmm. with two classicists? When you look at their engagement with other religions, I find that they highly um, appreciated the, the uh, emotional draw to religion, the, the creative one, the imaginative one. Uh, and so for, for them, um, a huge element which interests them into religion was the imagination. For Otto, it was also a personal connection to, to the sacred, to uh, the, the holy, the, his idea of the holy. He, as a child of his time, in particular as a Lutheran professor of, of, um, of theology, he um, of course saw Christianity as, as very important for his, for his own per person, but he appreciated also that, um, that this concept of, of religion, like Schleiermacher before him, was present in all religions. And he traveled around. He did not do proper field work um, overseas, but he traveled around. Already as a student, he visited um, Great Britain and attended um, high church um, um, services. And then he went to Greece and, and got um, encountered with the Greek Orthodox. And then he went to, to Egypt and encountered Coptic um, Christians, but then also um, the different forms of Islam. And this um, led him then to, to further encounters with um, Islam in Northern Africa. But then in particular his journeys to Asia inspired him that there uh, are so many different forms of um, religious practice, but they all had in, 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 in uh, common um, this fascination, this mysterium trimonium fascinan, and so this concept of awe um, in, in, in the presence of, of, of uh, the deity, whether it is God or something else. And, and this is what, what still people attracts him, uh, attracts to, uh, to Otto. Lang, on the other side, always argued against Tyler, though he is always put in connection with Tyler. He was never a student of Tyler, and he disagreed with Tyler's quite intellectualist um, approach to religion, that religion is belief in spirit. And he really argued more on, a, on, a, on, on the emotional, on the felt uh, position. And this even was even stronger in Merritt, who also, though he was successor of Tyler, criticized Tyler's approach and definition of religion and argued that religion is something danced. 
Um, I have a quote, um, if I may. It is in the time of marriage, and so it was um, written in the beginning um, of, of the 20th century, and so he used the term savage religion, which we don't use today, uh, and uh, fortunately. <laughs> um, but he wrote, savage religion is something not too much thought out, but um, as danced out. And this is something which I also feel um, is present when I do my field work. My, one of my fields is um, spirit possession and trance, and so I attended rituals in various different countries. And there people don't discuss what religion is, but they feel it in the body. And this is what I think is a common aspect in, in, both, in all three of them. Interesting, because when you say imagination, um, an almost go-to kind of understanding of imagination would be Tyler and the idea of the savage philosopher who's sitting in his cave and is imagining all these things to explain the world around it. But the way you're describing it, imagination seems to serve a very different kind of function within the thinking of Otto and Lang mm -hmm. and Merit. So in the way that you're now talking about dance, how, do, how does this idea of imagination and dance, for instance, connect together? In this kind of thinking? Yeah, I think we have a different understanding of imagination. Mm. For me, imagination is really the creative aspect, the the, the wonderful performance, the, the feeling, the, the um, imagination leads an artist to paint. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and so this is for me um, imagination, while Tyler's minimal definition of religion um, uh, is not, yeah, yeah, you're right, he argued that people sat somewhere and, and, and imagined and invented it, uh, but, but he really thought that this is a logical answer to, to the question, how did religion start it, um, that it's really just um, um, a way to explain things. All three never never went in, into this direction. It was no, nothing about um, in in the work who, uh, that they wrote something that religion is to, um, a justification or something to explain. Or it's something to be felt, emotional aspect, and then imagining uh, what what it meant like and how the deity, the sacred, might might be, might enact, and might feel. Mm. And so it's not something intellectually thought of, but emotionally uh, responded to. Okay, so yeah, we have kind of Tyler's rationalistic kind of response. And I'm curious, I'm going to use the phrase anti-rationalist to now describe these three. Would you say that's a fair way of describing their approach? Well, Otto, Otto himself um, used in English translation the term non-rational. And, and I think this is... is um, also true, though they didn't use the term non-rational, but it's it's also um, in, in in between the line in in Lang and Marat's work. It's it's um, not a rationalistic intellectualist uh, definition of uh, of of the beginning of religion, but um, an emotional felt one. And therefore, yes, the focus is on the non-rational. I'm feeling a couple of questions coming along, and I, I know the RSP audience is probably thinking, oh no, it's Jonathan, he's going to ask all about phenomenology. So I'll hold back on those questions for now. Um, but on a more practical level, you're now talking about dancing. What kind of methodological challenges does that kind of throw up if we're focusing on the non-rational side of religions? If we can no longer read a book or read a statement and understand what is going there, what kind of challenges do you then face for studying and understanding religion? I start answering your question by saying, I'm not saying it's either or, mm. but just my argument is by acknowledging the non-rational as part of the study of religion, we also um, allow um, religious, spiritual experience, and even non-religious experience to be to be studied within study of religion. This does not mean that everything has to be then non-rational or experience. It, of course, study of religion uh, includes a wider range of of aspects. But at the moment, or from the beginning. 
study of religion focused on the controversy with theology and the, the, the aim to be acknowledged as science, as uh, academical value. And therefore, often people shied away to acknowledge that we are also studying counterculture, that we are studying new age, that we are also studying something like spirit possession. Uh, and, and my argument is by showing that at the beginning of the discipline, in the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century, this was already covered by some scholars who were very important in, in creating the field for study of religion. We can then have a trajectory which shows that this was more or less open or visible part of our discipline from the beginning. And which my argument is that it might help us to acknowledge that today when we study religions, we are studying all different kinds of religious practices and beliefs. We are not just looking at the dominant tradition, but we looking at what people do, the lived experience, the lived practice, the, the uh, vernacular traditions. And when we, when we start focusing on this aspect, we can we can study everything. We can still read books. We can still do the normal participant observation and interviews. Um, it's it's just that we also acknowledge the non-rational in our field. Interesting. So b building on that, because you, now that you've tied it into the idea of like lived religion and vernacular religion as kind of like the vogue trends of how to study religions these days, and tying it particularly to Otto, and you can then probably correct me on Lang and Marit if they do something similar, but when you're talking about Otto's Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans, it's a very, to use one of the words from one of the earlier panels, it's a visceral experience in the language of Otto. It's a very dramatic experience in the same way that you've described trances and spirit possessions, which are dramatic events and dramatic experiences. But how does this kind of approach then apply to the more humdrum kind of mundane understanding of lived religion and vernacular religion. When Otto used these Latin terms because he thought there is no equivalent, no way to express what he felt um, in, in ordinary uh, languages. This is why he went back to, to Latin. We also have to understand at that time Latin was still seen as the kind of a religious, the, the language of the church. And, and therefore, I think we should not so overemphasize that you use Latin, Latin phrases. Um, but you are, of course, right with my spirit possession and trance um, studies. It is, in particular, I'm, I, my, my field area is Latin America, and so I'm, I mainly focus on, on Afro-African diaspora. And the, these are very powerful performances. But, from the beginning, I also included, for instance, spiritism. Spiritism is not very dramatic. Um, it is more or less sitting around a table and, and, um, and the medium says that uh, the medium sees something or hears something. So it is not very dramatic. And this is also part of, of my own field work. And um, we also need to acknowledge the lived experience. It's sometimes playing in your own world and so in your own place or uh, being alone um, on a beach and this is all also a religious experience or a spiritual experience and also part of what we should um, study and so it's not just um, the, the dramatic performances but also um, performances which are perhaps or elements which are perhaps just in inside of ourselves and just um, I uh, want to argue that we should not just focus on aspects and practices which happen in religious uh, buildings like church or synagogue or, or mosque, but we also need to include what happened in the street, what happened when somebody is alone. This all is also part of, of uh, vernacular religious practices. It's interesting because you're talking about the importance of Lang, Otto and Marit, and that's very much in a way of it's important for us as scholars and academics, but one of the themes of the conference has been the public face 
of the university and particularly the reason I asked about trance and in t- particularly in terms of the visceral experience is when it comes to things like spirit possession that kind of thing will capture the public eye because it is kind of a dramatic thing and in your own presentation you had a one of the photographs had a woman who was moving around with a blade and so it's very eye-catching but when now as you say we need to also focus on the person who's praying in their living room or in a quiet corner somewhere but so how on a slightly more practical level do we present that kind of study of religion to the public in a way that is as captivating as some of the more visceral imagery that can sometimes be associated with religion before I answer your question about how we, we can speak yeah. about it, just uh, another comment. Sure. But Otto and Lang are both quite um, quite um, popular outside university. Lang, um, Otto's um, idea of the holy is translated in over 20 languages and some of them non-European. And people are still reading it. And Lang is was very dominant in the folklore uh, society and it's still very important in, in the material and so both um, had quite an impact in the public and still have. We have kicked them out of our uh, history uh, but the public is still enchanted by them and so uh, I think we also need to catch up what the, what the, the wider public reads uh, of, of, of uh, publications our field but back to your question this is always a problem I uh, a while ago I wrote about um, animal sacrifice for a publication on sacrifice and one of the um, question was whether I have um, uh, illustration for the publication and I said no because I didn't want that the public um, gets the wrong impression I wanted in my article to explain the normality of the practice and not the exoticism. So I don't have illustration, I don't give out illustration, and I don't show illustration of uh, sacrifice in any uh, presentation because it would give the wrong impression of, of, the, um, of the, the, the practice. With spirit possession, um, it's a bit different because Sometimes in publication I include um, some images or in, in presentations like like the uh, uh, the lecture yesterday, uh, but I find them wonderful. I find these uh, photos I've chosen a wonderful expression of creativity. The costumes are exotic. They are wonderful, colorful. Um, the the, uh, well, of course, in the, with the photo we cannot hear it, but the music is wonderful. The the whole um, performance is is just wonderful. It could be on stage, it could be in a theatre, it could be in a in an art gallery, and um, you can see in some uh, museums um, costumes presented in a museum because they are so creative and, and wonderful to, to look at. And so I, I've chosen them also as a way for the wider audience to realize um, spirit possession is not something negative. It's not about being possessed by the devil. It can also be a very positive um, experience. And this is what I want to, to convey with these uh, photos I've chosen. So uh, in a way, what we're doing is we're kind of taking the things that are visceral to the public and showing that they're not actually visceral. They're more mundane things. And then that will hopefully generate the things in other things that they already recognize as mundane as well. Also in order to, to counterbalance a stereotype um, image, what they have often um, and when they hear the term spirit possession. Thank you very much, Bettina Smith, for being my test subject with the video format. I hope you enjoyed the experience. <laughs> well, I hope it uh, got over quite well. <laughs> yes, so do I. <laughs> All that remains for me to say is thanks for watching this time, not just thanks for listening. So, thank you for watching. The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions.
Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett and our opportunities digest by Yana Shirley. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio assistance from Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. Don't forget, you can support the project using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or by donating at patreon.com backslash project RS. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.